So I, I wanted to give a brief flavor of what I've been doing. It's also give you a little sense of what I did during my fellowship, which I haven't pursued over the last five years, but I'm still passionate about for various reasons that I will discuss. So as Dr. McNeely said, when I left, uh, yes, Pardon. Sure. So when I left uh, Vancouver, I went to Boston, uh, and I spent the first two years in Boston under the tutelage of Dr. Rosalind Adam and uh, Joshua Mani doing tissue engineering research, which was very sensational and translational, and I got into it right away. In the in 2010 to 2012. I studied the use of silk as a biomaterial in augmenting bladder. So silk was, had been used previously in vascular medicine, in using grafts and studying grafts in Boston in a lab outside Harvard. And Harvard has brought silk into the realm of urology because it's, it's one of the strongest natural fibers in existence. It's non-immunogenic, it was stable, and we could easily tune the properties of silk and manipulate it to our advantage such that it would be usable in the urinary tract. So we augmented the bladders of pigs, which is shown here, using silk acellular scaffolds, using the robot and open techniques, and in rats. You Here you see a patch of silk in the rat bladder. And we studied... the robot here too? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was actually a dedicated research robot at Boston Children. So we were able to use that to do pig augments initially, but then realized that it was it was a long surgery, which was not worth it. So we started doing them open, and lots of pigs died. So uh, we realized open techniques were better uh, in doing pig augmentations. So we studied the properties of tissue regeneration using silk uh, acellular scaffolds. And we showed that we were able to regenerate smooth muscle, urothelium, vessels, as well as nerves in rat bladders. I spent majority of my two years doing systometries in rat, awake systometries in rat. Uh, and we showed that we were able to enhance the capacity in, in rodents using these scaffolds. Not only did we regenerate normal bladder wall, and similar studies were done in a, in a porcine model. And we were able to see... Uh, regeneration of urothelium, smooth muscle, as well as nerves. However, as I started to look for a job in 2013, I was soon told that this field is very difficult to get funded. Uh, I was discouraged to pursue this research moving forward, even though this was initially my passion. Uh, I started to look for a job. I wanted to do basic science research, and uh, this brought me to Baylor College of Medicine, where I met uh, Dr. Dolores Lamb, who has been my mentor for the past five years. Her research focused on understanding the genetic basis of urological birth, birth defects. And she had a very established infrastructure at Baylor where I was plugged in, and she mentored me into the research that I am doing today and have been doing for the past five years in understanding what caused these GU birth defects. And the latter, the majority of my talk will be focused on what I've been doing over the last five years. So GU birth defects are extremely common, most common of which is cryptorchidism. One in 33 male live births are born with an undescended testes. Uh, and this testes can be anywhere from intra-abdominal to inguinal. Less common is hypospadias, which occurs in 1 in 100 to 250 live births. And even less common is uh, a complete sex reversal, which happens in 1 to 2,000 to 4,000 live births. So surgical correction of these GU, GU anomalies remains problemat problematic. First of all, they are very expensive. Average cost per hypospadias repair remains about 5,000, and this was almost a decade ago, the cost of repairing these geo anomalies is constantly rising. And you have to understand that this geo anomaly is repaired mostly on an outpatient basis. There are more complex anomalies which take much, which require hospitalization are much more expensive to repair. They're complex. The surgical outcomes of 
hypospadias repair, especially the, the proximal hypospadias repair, still remain uh, not optimal. We published a paper a couple of years ago showing that the complication rate of two-stage hypospadias repair is close to 60% still. So it is not ideal. The repair is not ideal, and it's morbid. So there are complications that have sequelae, require multiple surgeries, they have complications and may have psychological sequelae which lead to much later on in life. So while we know that chromosomal abnormalities and environmental toxin cause some of these abnormalities, majority of these GU birth, de GU birth defects have no known cause. Genetic screening studies done in patients with hypospadias have shown that some point mutations might be responsible for these but what are the functional consequences of these uh, mutations? It's still not known. So my lab has focused on understanding the molecular mechanisms understanding, underlying these GU birth defects. So we have adopted a strategy in studying this. We start with patients who have GU anomalies, and now we have a huge bank of patients with, uh, of DNA from patients with GU anomalies. We then perform GU, uh, gene <coughs> genetic testing, a genome testing, which could be whole exome sequencing or array comparative genome, uh, genomic hybridization arrays in these patients. This serves as a discovery experiment, and we get a whole bunch of mutations and uh, anomalies in these patients. We prioritize the candidate genes that come up using these discovery experiments. We define their protein function. We then make mouse models which lack these particular genes in question to see if we can recapitulate the defect in the mouse to prove causalities. Using this, we study the molecular mechanisms of GU development. So I'm going to show you an example of this that we have been doing over the last five years, uh, which has been funded by the NIH. So array comparative genomic hybridization is a technique that we, our lab has used the most. In short, this involves taking DNA from two sources, one normal and one patient with geo anomalies. We denature the DNA into a single stranded and label this with fluorophores. And we then hybridize this to the full set of metaphase uh, phase of, uh, of the chromosome. And we then compare differential signals using uh, the differential signals and see if there's any imbalance uh, of signals using the two sources. And we can now detect um, deletions which were not deletions and duplications which were not previously detected by a karyotype using this technique. So when we do this, we get a whole bunch of micro deletions and micro duplications. And we don't know which one is, is the one which is actually causing the defects. So we have come up with an algorithm to prioritize which copy number variations to select. The algorithm uh, is, is this. We select CNVs located in reason, regions not found to occur commonly in general <coughs> population, as documented by public databases such as Decipher. Copy number variations identified, which are identified by RACGH, are then confirmed with either PCR or FISH. A CNV is considered to be more pathogenic if it is a deletion a homozygous deletion or an application, application with more than one copy gain. And then we look for evidence of causality, which could be that it has to be de novo chain present in, in need, not present in either patient. Um, it's a clustering of unrelated patients with GU birth defects at overlapping regions or significant association with GU defects when compared with subjects without GU defects. So using array CGH, we discovered two patients with defects at locus 16P11.2 and concomitant genitourinary tract anomalies, the first of which is shown here. This patient had a microduplication spanning this region, and this patient also had hypospadias, cryptorchidism, and micropenis. A de novo deletion at the same locus was identified in a second child with hypospadias by array CGH. This shows the minimally deleted region in another a a array CGH patient who had isolated hypospadias. This locus covered a total of eight complete genes, including the gene of focus, KCTD13, and one partial gene. Next, I reviewed each gene in detail, including its known functionality, its expression profile, and any published literature regarding 
this its role in geo development. Majority of these genes, with the exception of MAS and KCDD13, are not well expressed in geo tract. Little is known about their function, and there are no reports of their influence on the developing geo tract. Based on this, it was felt that KCTD13 was the most plausible candidate gene responsible for interfering with geo development. KCTD13 is a, is a gene which encodes for a substrate-specific adapter of E3 ubiquitin ligase. It has known functions in regulation of cytoskeletal structure, cell migration via ubiquitination of a protein called Rho A. It is also known to uh, play a role in regulating cellular progenitors, especially in the nervous system. So given this, we hypothesize that gene dosage changes in KCTD13 re uh, result in aberrant development of the lower urinary tract by impacting androgen receptor signaling. So we confirmed the presence of this duplication by PCR and found that the father uh, found that the father who was asymptomatic also had the same duplication. We screened close to 300 patients and found that C and V, the copy number variation in this gene, are more, much more common in patients with GU anomalies compared to patients without. Of note, the background rate of defects in this gene are extremely low, 0.22%. This was based on a study, a population-based study conducted by Tucker et al., which included close to 6,000 patients. So of the seven patients that we found, we found that although the majority of them were a lower tract defect, including undescended testes and hypospadias, there were a few who had upper tract defects in, uh, as well, including uh, UPG obstruction and reflux. The red indicates a deletion and the blue indicates a duplication. We then reviewed the literature to see if we could find other patients with defects in this, and we found close to 30 patients with defects in, in this gene, KCTD13, as well as concomitant GU tract anomalies. While majority of these defects were lower urinary tract, which included ambiguous genitalia, undescended testes, and uh, uh, other penile anomalies, there were upper tract defects as well. Over here, these are all the patients that we found where red indicates a deletion and the blue indicates a duplication. We then wanted to know if KCTD13 was expressed in the urinary tract. So we conducted in situ hybridization. Uh, Antisense uh, in situ hybridization probes were designed against KCTD13, where blue indicates the presence of mRNA of interest. So we see that uh, KCTD13 is robustly expressed in the developing urinary tract. These are embryos, mouse embryos, um, and with the bottom most shows the, the genital tubercle of the mouth and you mm -hmm. see that uh, compared to the control, uh, the KCTD13 was robustly expressed in the urinary tract of the developing mouse. When we look at the penis and testicle in detail, we see that KCTD13 expression changes as the mouse is developing. Initially, in the testis, the KCTD13 expression is limited to, pardon, pardon, KCTD13 expression is limited to uh, the the, the germ cells. However, as the mouse develops and postnatally, this, this expression uh, extends to uh, interstitium and also uh, we see KCD13 expressed also in Leydig cells. In the penis, we see case, robust KCD13 expression in the urethra as well as epithelial lamina. So we see that this molecule is expressed robustly in, in penis and testicle giving it more plausibility in terms of its effect on the GU tract. We looked at its expression in cell, uh, GU tract-derived cell lines, and we found that KCDD13 was prominently expressed in the cytoplasm of, of uh, urothelial cells, uh, human embryonic kidney cells, uh, uh, smooth muscle cells, giving us more evidence that this was the, the gene which was causing the defect. So how do we prove causality? How do we then prove that this is the gene that actually is causing the defect? We go to the mouse model. We, we used CRISPR-mediated mutagenesis to delete exon 2 of KCTD13 by targeting intronic uh, sequencing flanking uh, exon 2 
to delete this gene in its entirety. Uh, we then made a mouse heterozygous for KCTD13. This is a slide which shows that in our mouse, we, we lost complete expression of KCTD13 using uh, Western blot and uh, immunohistochemistry. Um, uh, deletion of exon 2 resulted in a denatured protein which was not expressed, which we don't see any expression of. Then we started to phenotype this mouse focusing on the GU tract. What we found was there was an extremely high incidence of cryptorchidism in the null and heterozygous mouse. As you can see, panel A shows a wild-type mouse with both testes present in the scrotum. We see a dose-dependent increase in the frequency of cryptorchidism. In panel B, we see <coughs> A, a mouse with unilateral cryptorchidism when one of the testicle is present near the bladder and the other is present in the scrotum. That mouse is heterozygous. And then we see a null mouse with both testes present by the bladder in the abdomen. Uh, not only were these testes cryptorchid, but they were si significantly smaller compared to the wild type mouse. And there was a dose dependent. Uh, uh, change in the, in the size and the frequency of uh, undescended testes. We also found that the null mouse had significantly reduced epididymis and seminal vesicle weights compared to the wild type mouse, both of which are androgen sensitive organs. We looked at the fertility of these mice and we found that the null mouse was significantly subfertile compared to the null mouse, both in terms of the number of litters produced and the number of pups per litter were significantly lower in the null mouse compared to the, the wild type mouse. We did semen analysis. We extracted sperm from the epididymis, epididyma of these mice, and we found that the sperm count as well as sperm motility of these mice were significantly lower compared to the wild type mouse. Then we looked at the histology of the testes of the, uh, of, of the aging mice. While the testis histology of a younger mouse was fairly normal. As the mice aged, we saw significant abnormalities in the seminiferous tubules of these mice where some seminiferous tubules showed Sertoli-only phenotype while others showed vacuolation and germ cell depletion. We then focused on <coughs> Sertoli cell markers to see if there was a reduction in Sertoli cell numbers. So SOX9 is a Sertoli cell marker and we looked at Using immunofluorescence and Western, uh, Western blot analysis, we showed that we had reduced Sertoli cell number in the seminiferous tubules of the mutant mouse compared to the wild type mice. Now, each seminiferous, each Sertoli cell can only support a set number of spermatogonia. So, because the Sertoli cell were reduced, we wanted to see if the spermatogonia were also reduced. So, we looked at uh, the PLZF, which is a mar marker of spermatogonia, and we also found that spermatogonia per spermatogonia per seminiferous tubule were significantly reduced in the, in the mutant mouse. We then used micro-CT to look at the morphology of the penis, and we found that the mouse penis was, was malformed in the mutant mouse. It was significantly smaller. Uh, now, the mouse penis is quite different from the human penis. The mouse penis has a bone caused, called the baculum, and it has the mump, which is called the maiden protuberance. We found that the baculum or the bone was shorter and narrower in the mutant mouse compared to the wild type mouse. We found that the maiden protuberance was also significantly shorter in the, in the, in the mutant mouse. <coughs> Then we wanted to understand, well, what is the mechanism? Why is, are we seeing all these abnormalities? So the low, the low hanging fruit is the androgen receptor because we know androgen receptor is extremely important. It's a member of the steroid receptor family of the nuclear transcription factors. Uh, we know that, 
It's related to prostate cancer. <laughs> Indeed, it is. Uh, uh, we know that it has a well-established role in the development and differentiation of, the ge of male genitalia. We know that abnormalities of androgen receptor result in a wide spectrum of disorders of sexual differentiation, ranging from hypospadias to complete sex reversal. And we know that androgen receptor is re dif regula differentially regulated by E3 ubiquitin ligases and KCTD13, which is the gene of interest, encodes a substrate-specific adapter of such a ligase. And most importantly, the phenotype seen in both humans, which consists of undescended testes, micropenis, and hypospadias, and in mice, what I just showed you, undescended testes, micropenis, sperm, low sperm count, uh, smaller uh, feminine vesicles, and epididymis, reflect a disturbance of the AR signaling axis. So given the KCDD13 uh, established function in ubiquitination and the undervirilized phenotype that we saw in both humans and mice, we hypothesize that loss of KCTD13 decreases AR degradation and decreases its downstream activity. So first of all, we, we look to see if, if we, in vitro assays, if we knock down or if we reduce the mRNA levels of KCTD13, do we have any changes in the expression of or the mRNA levels of AR? And because we know KCTD13 acts at degradation level, we did not see any alteration in mRNA levels uh, with, uh, with KCTD13 loss. However, we did see uh, KCTD13 uh, KCT loss increases AR protein levels in AR transfected HeLa cells. This was seen at both, uh, uh, both uh, with Western blot and in immunohistochemistry. We saw that increased cyto we saw increase although we have an increased levels of cytoplasmic levels of AR, there are decreased nuclear AR levels with androgen with short androgen exposures and KCT13 knockdown, suggesting that there may be a problem of AR translocation into the nucleus when you take KCT13 away, uh, perhaps resulting in the underfertilized phenotype that we see. This effect was only seen in short intervals. However, we saw all of AR translocate into the nucleus by 90 minutes. This was confirmed with Western blood analysis. We saw that uh, at short intervals, short exposures with androgen, uh, nuclear levels of AR were significantly reduced with knockdown of KCTD13 in AR transfected HeLa cells. Now, we wanted to see if we see a similar thing in, in, vitro, in vivo, and we found that in vivo, the AR levels were reduced in the testis as well as the penis of, uh, of the mutant animals compared to the wild type. Next, we wanted to see if, if downstream activity of AR is, is altered in in vitro, and we found that AR target genes, NRG1 and SGK1, both of which are involved in cell cycling, are significantly downregulated with KCTD13 knockdown in, in uh, LN cap cells, which have endogenous expression of AR. We also noticed that KCTD13 loss results in cytoskeletal changes in GU cell lines, suggesting we need an intact cytoskeleton for AR translocation into the nucleus. Because taking KCTD13 alters this cytoskeleton, it may alter the end nuclear translocation of AR, resulting in the undervirilized phenotype that we see. More evidence that this is possibly the mechanism which is causing the, the phenotype that we are seeing in both humans and in, in uh, mice. So in conclusion, we showed that CNBs and KCT13 are much more common in patients with GU anomalies than in control patients. KCTD13 mutant mice show significant penile and testis anomaly, mimicking the undervirilized phenotype seen in humans. Acute exposure to antigen in model cell lines show increased cytoplasmic AR levels, but decreased nuclear AR levels with short AR exposures in vitro. And KCTD13 mutant mice show decreased AR levels in the testis and penis, explaining the undervirilized phenotype that we see in both humans 
and mice. I just wanted to show a couple of more slides on, on what we are doing with reflux. Now, this is a mouse model that explains undescended testes and, and, and hypospadias using mice models. We are also looking at genetic basis of reflux. Reflux, as we know, is extremely common. It's present in 1% of the population, and it has very significant clinical sequelae, such as polynephritis, renal scarring, uh, hypertension, and reflux nephropathy. Uh, but what causes reflux is largely unknown as well. We know a little bit that we can infer a genetic etiology of reflux using the fact that it's, there is familial clustering, there are sex-dependent differences in incidence of, of reflux, there are congenital syndromes where reflux is more common, and there have been linkage analysis studies which, which implicate genetics in the etiology of uh, reflux. However, there have been very few candidate genes thus far that have been elucidated in the etiology of reflux. We hypothesize that we can use the same genetic test uh, techniques like array compared to, compared to genomic hybridization arrays to identify novel candidate genes. And we've found one such gene. We found KCNG4, which is located on 16Q24.1. We found several patients with deletions in these genes and concomitant G anomaly, primarily consisting of reflux. Uh, we found more patients in, in public databases with hypospadias and reflux uh, and, and uh, abnormalities in this gene. We found that this gene was uh, robustly expressed in the mouse, especially in the GU tract. We went ahead and made the mouse where we deleted this gene and we, we did phenotypic analyses uh, in in that mouse and we found that mice lacking this gene have significant in significantly increased incidence of reflux. Not only do they have reflux, but they have cystic changes in their kidneys, uh, histologically speaking. So we have discovered a novel model for uh, of reflux where we can study mechanisms underlying reflux and cystic dysplasia, which has not been found before. And this is this has recently been submitted to the NIH for a, a new grant, which is currently being reviewed. So this is what I've been doing over the last nine years. And I have to thank my mentor, Dr. Dolores Lamb, which has been instrumental in the work that I've been doing over the last 10 years. She has been my, my mentor and my PhDs that are in my lab, Dr. Jorge and Dr. Rivera, uh, and my clinical partners, especially Dr. Cole and Dr. Roth, who have supported my research. I have to thank the NIH for their funding support. I was a K-12 scholar and this research was primarily supported by funds from them for over the last five years and the SPU oh, who gave me a grant over the last year to support this research. Thank you very much.